Good evening. I think I know most people here, um, but maybe not everyone. I'm Martina Droth. I'm the Deputy Director of Research, Exhibitions and Publications here at the Centre and Curator of Sculpture. And I'm really delighted to introduce tonight's talk um, by Anne Wagner, who is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley. And I want to mention also that this lecture is supported by the Rhoda Pritzker Fund for Lectures in Modern British Art. So we're grateful for that funding. Anne Wagner has um, taught at Berkeley for many years, most recently as the class of 1936 professor, and has been emeritus since 2010, and now lives in London. And as I learned this morning, when um, Anne and myself, um, together with Jennifer Rabb from the History of Art Department, joined Jenny's students for a class on um, Yale's uh, public sculptures as part of Jenny's course on contested monuments. I learned that Anne was one of the first women undergraduates at Yale, having studied here in 1969 to 71. And um, I also learned that Anne is originally from Connecticut and was in high school here um, at a time when Yale wasn't an option. It then became an option in 1969, for women that is, after Anne had already done two years of undergraduate studies and then switched um, to come to Yale. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because I learned all this while we were with the class looking at Mayolin's women's table, which uh, marks the history of co-education um, at Yale. And Anne's presence there made it suddenly feel very real. And also the incredible recentness um, seemed so stark that only so recently could women come and study at Yale. And uh, currently the women's table is strewn with um, flowers and notes. For those of you who haven't walked by, it's quite a moving sight and quite an experience to stand there together this morning. Um, and our class took us around some of the other Yale outdoor sculptures. We looked at the Klaus Oldenburg lipstick, which is tucked away at Morse College. I also recommend a look at it, really interesting. And Richard Serra's stacks, which are also tucked away somewhere. Um, this, in this case, in the Yale Art Gallery in a, in a special courtyard. And, um, and then, of course, the Maya Lin piece, which is much more accessible than either of those pieces. Anyway, I'm thinking about this because we're about to head into a talk um, about Henry Moore, uh, a prolific maker of large-scale uh, large outdoor public sculptures, and not just in Britain, from where he hailed, um, or Europe, but very much so in this country. Um, in, in, in America. And Anne will talk specifically about um, a work that he made for Chicago, which is often referred to as nuclear energy, but which Henry Moore actually made as atom piece. So Anne Wagner is a historian, art historian, whose work centers on sculpture. And in recent years, she's focused on British sculptors, but her writings have ranged um, very widely um, across the 19th century, the 20th and the 21st centuries. And I actually first became familiar with her work in the 1990s when I was a student in London. And I read her first monograph, which was about the French 19th century sculptor, Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, some of whose works we have um, in the Yale Art Gallery. And um, a really fantastic book that at the time opened my eyes to how um, exciting a monograph on a 19th century sculptor could be. And there weren't too many other examples of that kind around at the time. So, um, and then, as her, as her work has, has, has moved on to look at other artists and some of the really major and familiar um, figures, like Henry Moore, who oftentimes are seen as rather traditional. Um, and I think what's been so important is that um, her work has um, transformed some of those artists for our times um, and, and really prompted a rediscovery of their work. So a rediscovery of Henry Moore as someone that I think a lot of people felt they knew that artist. So um, I'm really delighted to have Anne here and talk with us about Henry Moore's Atom Piece. Please um, join me in welcoming Anne Wagner. On my um, podium, I have a little note that says, please mind your step, P. 
because I'm standing up to be able to get over this podium and I'm particularly happy that I am because I can sort of see you and project to you and to Martina my thanks uh, for this invitation. It's been um, uh, uh, an intense day for me. I've spent a couple of hours wandering around this campus uh, and feeling haunted by my 20-year-old self in a very uh, interesting way. This was an intense place at the time uh, of my two years here, and I think from my experience um, with the class today that the students now are infinitely more balanced and thoughtful uh, than we were at the time. Thank you for that experience. I really enjoyed talking to you. Now I want to um, turn to Henry Moore, who I also very much enjoy talking about. Um, I'm going to give a, a lecture uh, which begins with an historiographical um, assertion. However banal that uh, gambit may seem to you, I want to insist that no work no work by Henry Moore has been more thoroughly and interestingly studied than the monumental sculpture he called Adam Peace. I think that special status stands to reason. Like Rodin's Balzac before it, his bronze has a place among those few 20th century monuments that somehow manage to steer clear of commemoration by rote. You know, goodbye to some generic X of an artwork, more or less stodgily marking a person or place. Moore's goal wasn't simply to label his site, though this task was certainly an aspect of the commission he received. In its wisdom, the University of Chicago was after a bronze to sit somewhere here if not directly atop, then at least in the near vicinity of the converted underground squash court um, that for 25 years, that 25 years earlier in 1942, housed the efforts of a team of physicists led by the brilliant Italian Enrico Fermi to bring off what would be the first, the first controlled nuclear reaction. This was the experiment that proved conclusively that the atom's energy could be harnessed, transported, and released. Perhaps fittingly, this part of the Chicago campus has been regularly, even routinely, reworked. Here's how it looked in 1967. At the moment Moore's monument was installed, its transformation still underway. And if you look actually at the right side of that slide, you'll see that they're still kind of working on the landscape, trying to wrestle this uh, central space on the campus into the shape they want it to take. Uh, no more exercise, uh, welcome commemoration. Now here's the same site which is seen head on 50 years later. I took this slide last December and I did it because I was noticing at the time that the big granite block that fronts the sculpture bears its official title, not Adam Peace, but Nuclear Energy, the rubric that, as I say, in large letters it carries today. So two titles, one sculpture. And the question immediately is whether anything hangs on which one we use. In 1967, to speak of nuclear energy was inevitably to conjure the death and devastation caused by the nuclear bomb. Actually, I just remembered reading that sentence, something I haven't thought of for ages, which was an argument I had with my father in about 1967 about how terrifying nuclear energy was, and he thought it was the road of the future. Uh, so it was very much on um, people's minds. By then, this is why I suppose, the bomb had been exploded again and again. After its first test, uh, the date was July 16th, uh, 1945, and the site was the New Mexican desert. 
It was deployed a month later, first against Hiroshima and then Nagasaki. No one knows how many people were killed outright in the ensuing conflagrations, somewhere between 129,000 and 226,000, it's thought. It's a pretty big gap and a pretty wide demography of people who lost their lives. The majority of them inevitably were non-combatants, women, children, the elderly, the weak, the ill, and their deaths didn't put an end to nuclear detonations. Larger and more lethal weapons continue to be tested as nation after nation, eight at present, gained mastery of fission and fusion. Moore's, I hope you can read that. That will show you exactly where things stand uh, on the or stood in 2016 on uh, the nuclear front, the weight and importance uh, of national engagement with this particular weapon and the size of uh, weapons released. On that graph, the initial tests look uh, fairly tiny. Moore's desire to include, if not the word peace in his title, then at least its homonym, was rooted in his reluctance to surrender his commitment to the policy then generally known as Adams for Peace. A long-standing pacifist, he had suffered the physical effects of innovative weaponry himself. Gassed toward the end of World War I during the assault on Cambrai, he then lived through England's bombardment in the course of the Blitz. The reason he set such store by the title Adam Peace, so his biographer tells us, was because, however wishfully, the phrase links his bronze to the project of peace. And even, no doubt, this particular policy now feels like a distant memory to the post-war effort undertaken by President White, Di, sorry, Dwight D. Eisenhower and his government to convince the nation's allies, especially those in Europe, that with the war now over, it was possible to imagine a future built on the constructive, even, even the reparative potential of atomic energy to reunite the world. That's the policy that in the early 1950s gave birth to a sustained campaign of images. You see examples on the screen at the moment from promise-filled speeches to newly issued Atomic Age stamps, all sharing the vision of a world made whole by the atom's healing force. That same vision was memorably presented in the address delivered by Eisenhower himself to the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 8, 1953. Here's the heart of the President's message. The United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. It's far from clear how reassuring these, were, these words were. Remember that the war's aftermath saw an unsettling range of responses to the first uses of the bomb. Consider this photograph which John O'Brien includes in his Camera Atomica, the largest compendium we have of the place of the photograph vis-a-vis -vis the bomb. Taken and published in Washington, D.C. in 1946, the picture records a military man and his lady wife marking the festive occasion of a bikini atoll test, Operation Crossroads by together cutting into a gravity-defying mushroom cloud cake. Unsurprisingly, both cake and photo were immediately condemned, this is a good thing, 
by a Unitarian minister, Arthur Powell Davies, as nothing less than obscene. I haven't really thought that this uh, cake actually uh, now takes a place in, in the little row of politicized cakes, which is organizing itself before us at the present moment. A few years later, however, the nation's mood had darkened considerably. The arms race was on, and in the 1950s, American children, we all know this, were being taught to duck and cover in the classroom. Bomb shelters were being built in backyards. And at the University of Chicago, the scientists who had played a role in the Manhattan Project continued to bring out a new product, a atomic publication of their own, a house organ which they titled The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. From the start, the first issue appeared in autumn 45. It took as its chief purpose the presentation of an annual assessment of the risk of ultimate war. To represent this terrifying calculation, they invented the tool they named the Doomsday Clock. In June 1947, two years after the conclusion of World War II, its hands read seven minutes to midnight. Seventy years later, in January 2017, the, uh, the, this date, January 17th, you'll know it was uh, six days after the inauguration of Donald Trump, the hands of the clock shot abruptly ahead. Once again, as in 1953, they stood at a mere two and a half minutes from midnight. 22 months later, now, in other words, today, the Chicago physicists Judge Doomsday, Armageddon, to be a terrifying, if figurative, two minutes, 120 seconds away. Since 1945, as the threats wax and wane, the nuclear football, which if you don't know, is the jarringly Bula Bula nickname for the briefcase containing the launch codes needed to unleash America's nuclear arsenal, continues to travel everywhere with the current president slash commander in chief. Perhaps it's also worth noting that for security reasons, the identity of the officer charged with the safekeeping of that ultra valuable satchel has never been released. At least this was the case until the moment early in his administration when President Trump pointed him out to a scandalized public and press. Needless to say, Adam Peace did and does not engage this political narrative, nor did it take up matters of policy. Its intention on the face of things is purely commemorative. And this aim separates the bronze from the main body of the artist's work, though not from his moderately left of center views. Himself a staunch opponent of the use of nuclear weapons, Moore nonetheless lived in a country keen to become a nuclear power, though as it happened, its nuclear imagery came first. This, this poster from the summer of 1951. A year later, the goal uh, for nuclear capability was achieved with the detonation of a plutonium implosion device on October 3rd, 1952. From this point, the size and frequency, as you already know, of testing grew rapidly as one by one the major powers tried out their wares. A pacifist, more declined an invitation to become a member of the Committee of 100, which was the activist arm of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. 
Uh, nor did he use his work in sculpture to speak out. Instead, he endorsed more peaceful modes of protest, protests also sponsored by the CND. In the 50s and 60s, its rallies and marches were throngs. As I say, Moore fully endorsed such demonstration, but there's no record of him having joined the throng. And, those, and on those occasions when he did deploy his work to espouse a cause or take up a dedicatory purpose, the result was usually intimate in purpose and sight. I think for one particularly affecting example of his memorial figure of 1945-46, with which in its rhythmic stony quietude commemorates a beloved teacher at the Progressive Devon Institution, Darlington Hall. I want to look at memorial figure alongside Adam Peace, because it seems easy at first to conclude that these two works draw on quite distinct idioms. Consider the carving first. Unlike the teacher that the sculpture remembers, Moore's figure is female, as tradition mandates. Equally familiar is his use of one of his favorite materials, which is Horton Stone, an Oxfordshire limestone named for the location of its principal quarries. Isn't the Hepworth outside, is that Horton Stone? Did that, no, what stone is it? Pardon? And yeah, okay, Frankoster stone. But Moore was absolutely tied to Horton Stone, and this work is uh, that. Um, of course, if you add the lichen, which is uh, all over it now, and so on so much of Moore's work, it becomes all too easy to miss the streamlined stability, the, the kind of linear presence. Um, it's time-marked surface works to undo. Memorial figure is, despite its lichen, unquestionably modern, but it still manages to look romantically rustic even so. And then there's Adam Peace. How do we speak to its tone? Do either of its titles manage to capture the look of the piece? Like memorial figure, the bronze too is a decidedly figurative sculpture. This much is obvious. But the question of what is being figured is, I think, genuinely hard to decide. Say we start at the top with the raised and swollen dome lifted on a sort of massive tripod that from some viewpoints looks particularly rough-hewn, even ungainly. Yet from others, it seems less massive, less bulky, a realization that eventually helps make visible the delicate tension of its presence in space. Such subtleties bring home an even more fundamental recognition. As a whole, the sculpture lacks sufficient symmetry to allow us easily to decide what it is. Say we focus on the dome. From certain viewpoints, it lifts and bulges enough to suggest a head, or maybe even a head wearing a helmet. It's this quality of fullness that have prompted earlier writers on Adam Peace to evoke the small and distinctly uncanny group of works that starting in 19, I have to go to them, here they are, starting in 1939, more devoted to the theme of the helmet and particularly the helmet as head. Why term these pieces uncanny? These are the two that I have in mind, um, the one from, the, from uh, Edinburgh and then uh, the one from the Tate. I think they're uncanny because though they're inert, they seem more animate than thing-like, none more hauntingly than the works that seem to protect and sometimes to nurture a small surrogate enclosed in the whole. 
This is the case with the lead helmet, which is now in Scotland, which was produced as the threat from Germany was increasing in lead, that toxic material to which more t seems to turn uh, most in um, the war years, I believe. Other versions, now here I'm thinking of the bronze in London at the Tate, look distinctly weaponized, even while they, while they too seem to shelter another being or thing. With those in mind, look again at Adam Peace. It too evokes warfare and weaponry, defense and offense, helmet and head. Seen from this angle in particular, uh, one leg of its tripod conveys a decidedly martial lift and flare, while the shapes above it evoke an eye and, a, and an ear. And this helmetness, if we can use that word, helmetness, which maybe is uh, a certain lingering martial quality, is undoubtedly the aspect of Moore's work most internalized by the Leeds Borden sculptor Thomas Hausago in his own series of warrior portraits, a rough and ready set of heads that take us from the Iliad to Alexandre Dumas to Moore to Batman, all in the blink of an eye. It would be a good show to do to bring all these helmets together because you would find them sort of transforming themselves mutating through the, sort of the history of masculinity, I think right before your eyes, or the myth of masculinity. But this idea of the helmet, which uh, is pursued by both artists, but per begun by Moore, that idea isn't the only proposal on the table. There are two further arguments to weigh in uh, this much, when it, that concern this uh, much studied work. First, that what the piece most resembles is a skull, and second, that its form evokes the great plume and billow of a nuclear explosion, the form that with a kind of obscene organicism we call a mushroom cloud. The Berkeley-based writer Ian Boll was the first to suggest that as Moore worked on his monuments, he had in mind an inspired poster, this poster here, which was produced for the campaign for nuclear dis disarmament in 1963 by a German-born designer, Frederick H.K. Henrion, or maybe you would want to say Orion, but I think if he's German, not Henrion, inspired because its grinning ghoul and festive cloud wreath seem so splendidly macabre, they might easily have been borrowed from Hans Holbein's great 1538 series of woodcuts, the definitively macabre dance of death. But if the chain of images leads us back to more, it's catalyzed by the idea that the sculptor found his central impulse here in the sight of death. His sculpture, so the argument goes, embodies a skull. But can we be sure that this is the case? Wouldn't it be appropriate to ask how much resemblance there is between a human skull and Adam piece, between the bronzes smoothly bulging surface and a cranium's decidedly idiosyncratic ins and outs. There is a measure of likeness, obviously. To describe more sculpture is more or less inevitably to declare that it's topped by a dome. At the same time, we don't really need to call on visual evidence, as I'm doing, to recognize that however dome-like they may seem, the bones of the cranium don't form a smooth and interrupted surface. Even at maturity, the human skeleton, especially the skull, continues to register the initial vulnerability of its infantile morphology, a vulnerability lessened 
but not erased with the passage of time. Moore's seamlessly swelling bronze mass, by contrast, seems sui generis, armored, invulnerable, its mortality expunged. And this impression is upheld by the sculpture's seemingly massive pillars. Yet their, rug their ruggedness is mostly rhetorical, meant to emphasize the qualities, the sort of reach and lift that make them convincing counterparts to the swollen bubble that they bear. And in my eyes, the bubble, the dome, is what seems unsettling about Adam Peace. The striking degree of surface tension conveyed by its crowning component, its volatile mass of a dome. A dome, but also brazenly, a bubble with staying power, no risk of it disappearing in the blink of an eye. Instead, it endures with an insistence that asks us to consider what its contradictions portend. My conclusion is toil, trouble, and worse. I think this is the moment to remember that the Chicago bronze, like the Dartington carving before it, did begin its life as a means or site of remembrance. The initial idea as recorded in the university archive was to commission a monumental bronze. Initially, both Moore and Jacques Lipschitz were approached. Lipschitz disgraced himself on matters of money and uh, Moore said he would do it for free, uh, to celebrate the memory of the Italian-born physicist Enrico Fermi, who died of stomach cancer in Chicago in 1954 at the age of 53. But we should really be saying continue to celebrate, given that well before Fermi's death, a modest memorial plaque marking his achievement was erected near Stagfield in his presence, that's Fermi, the littlest one, standing with a few key collaborators. Inevitably, the advancing stages of the group's research prompted more than one occasion for photographs, some with the whole team included. In one such document is, you can see her, can you find her? The only one, Leona Woods Libby, the only female physicist at work on the Manhattan Project, a specialist in tracking radiation using the Geiger counter, who, not incidentally, became pregnant as research progressed. Soon enough, she adopted baggy denim overalls rather than be banned from the site. Like Fermi and the rest of the work team, she was well aware that excessive exposure to radiation can cause various sorts of fetal damage, including brain deformation, severe mental retardation, and stunted growth. Here I'm referring to a fact sheet that though prepared uh, by the Center for Disease Control in 2011, declares its reliance on research conducted at Hiroshima and Nagasaki a good 50 years before. Yet, well before the atom bomb had become a reality, Libby and her colleagues knew the risks it posed to infant growth. As an aside, I will just let you know that Libby gave birth to a, a healthy boy who went on to live a normal life, so she ran a risk and got away with it. But this is the context, I think, in which Adam Peace starts making a slightly different sort of sense. Rather than dismiss the, fa the fact that among the people present when the first nuclear pile went critical was a, a pregnant physicist, or leave to one side her and our knowledge of the malign effects of radiation, I want to hold tight to both threads, shall we say, for dear life. This is not because I imagine for a moment that Moore was aware of 
Wood's wartime pregnancy. No doubt in most contexts her condition could have signaled little more than the approach of yet another blessed event. What I am aiming to accomplish, however, is to take from Wood's pregnancy the impetus to start to focus on what I take to be the special quality of fullness that Moore gave to his bronze. That effect was distinctly hard won. It may have been visible in a destroyed first maquette for the piece, though of course that's impossible to say. What can be said, however, it is that it's unquestionably among the features of the plaster now identified as an undated second version of the evolving design. So there was a first version of the maquette which disappeared. There's a second version which you see in these two different images, which is at Perry Green uh, uh, Moore's um, foundation at workshop and estate and residence in Hertfordshire. These, this is uh, version two. But then it turned out surprisingly and interestingly that the, both qualities of sort of fullness and uplift, as I'm calling them, were unexpectedly hard to scale up. And this is why I'm showing you two more models, both of which are also at the Moore Foundation in these very interesting period photographs in color uh, done as the work was underway. In one of them, the armature is distinctly, even like shockingly, inexplicably rough and ready, and I think that's a kind estimation. So much so that it's really hard to imagine it as having been made with any view towards the work's final shape. Even more puzzling, perhaps, is the tale told by the second plaster model, the one on the right in the image. Apparently, as the process of enlargement went forward, the top half of the piece began to revert or regress or diverge or something to the skull, the skull helmet hybrid. Only in this radiantly realized plaster, a lost work published once, strikingly close to the finished design, is the specter of war and the warrior at last laid to rest in favor of what is now a truly unsettling difference or a uh, truly remarkable difference, a radiant difference. Uh, between bottom and top. By July 1964, that effect was secure. We can see in this, uh, in this photograph that now Moore has settled on these massive pillars which seem to lift a weightless bubble in this image that almost seems to glow from within. I think to myself, no wonder that the sculptor has sort of placed his hands on the plaster. It's as if it's, he's feeling for a, a heartbeat or something, while at the same time keeping the plaster fixed to its base. This is, I'm just gonna tell some of the people who might be interested. This is a really strange photograph, which is tucked in at the end of volume three of the catalogue raisonne of, uh, Moore's works with no identification, no list, nothing. It's uh, just like they had a last page and they stuck this in and it's just an add-on. And uh, as you can see, I think that it is sort of, um, tells us uh, much about what the ultimate ambition for Adam Peace would be. And as an, ambi uh, as an ambition, this lightness, this sort of glowing dome was pursued intensely through the whole production process. And this is why I'm going to show you a series of works um, which take this composition for the final cast into production and um, follow it through that process so that each time we can focus on what is happening in particular to this dome. In the image on the screen at the moment, 
uh, you can see a focus on uh, um, uh, uh, that attention has yet to be given uh, to the various pieces and mold marks which are still legible on that crowning piece. And we can see that it, it is going to be settled and has been created so that it can sit down on these massive pillars which await it being uh, uh, um, mobilized, it moved into place. All this is happening at the Hermann Noack uh, foundry in Berlin, the foundry that he preferred uh, when it came to casting monumental bronzes, the bronzes which in the 60s and 70s became the public face of his art. Unusually, in the case of Adam Peace, some stages of the process were photographed. It really didn't occur very much. The two workers hoisting, uh, the dome seems almost to be being you know, looked at for inspection, one lifts the other points. You can see that the guy on the left is gesturing towards uh, where he's to go and what's to happen. I imagine them speaking as the uh, work goes on. And then in the foreground, yet to be finally grouped together, the three uh, pillars for the tripod base. And most interesting, interesting perhaps is the tracery of the welds and the joins and the seams, particularly the large one that's running around, uh, down uh, the uh, dome's center. Clearly, hours of work lie ahead. Uh, more welding, more sanding, more polishing and buffing. All this before the patinating chemicals blank out the queasy distortions so common in the bronze workers visual field. I can't resist uh, showing you this one on its own just because it takes us into this kind of world of reflection and um, a, you know, a, a, a mirror into or a world into which it's very easy it seems to me to fall. This all disappears of course and then uh, when the customary patination of more, Moore's bronzes had been completed, uh, only then could Adam Peace, uh, along with the Archer, which is going to Toronto, be hoisted and shipped and unloaded, and then uh, trucked to Hyde Park and uh, unloaded there, hoisted once again so the riggers could skid it towards its final destination. You can see the skids, can't you, that are in the left-hand image as it uh, is being moved by a crane solely to where it will end up. And then more making it his way around this high pedestal, the pedestal it still has, trying to see if it has settled in place. Uh, at the age of 69, he had come uh, to Chicago, as he did three times in the course of this production, looking at the site, thinking nothing of putting on his cap and his uh, coat and his muffler to spend several wintry hours weighing the pre precise position he wanted his work uh, to assume, and there, uh, under his eye, it's finally put into place. This is the, my, my dream photograph, my love photograph, him looking so beautifully centered at the work before, really, just before it's been released into its new world with the crane still positioning it. That stage is over. Uh, now uh, Adam Peace is in Chicago and still uh, sitting there winter and summer for an audience um, which is one of the most important aspects of the work. But at this point, before I turn to those issues, I want to underscore the uh, matters or questions I've been working to bring into view. Most important, is the evidence which suggests 
that in completing his sculpture, Moore was dogged by a stubbornly elusive problem of form. Was the sculpture to resemble a skull or a helmet or both? Although the two ideas might seem to be easily paralleled or even integrated, uh, Moore worked, clearly worked hard to forge an overlay. Then he seems to have concluded that the familiar linkage of the martial and the deathly, the skull and the helmet, would fall short. In other words, skull meets helmet didn't make for a material presence with sufficient metaphorical power to embody the topic at hand. Yet the solution that Moore found instead yielded an even more improbable composition, a dome rising above a tripod, a form playing the smooth against the roughly slashed and pitted, a conception that counters weighty pillars with a form that lifts and swells. And within this monument, monumental structure lies an interior. Moore said that to work within it felt like being inside an architectural cathedral. That's his phrase, the architectural cathedral. And he said, a large form was protecting me. In conclusion, I want to return to those words. At this point, however, a change of pace. It's time to note that nuclear energy has become the most visited site on, at the University of Chicago, sought out particularly by Japanese tourists, or better, pilgrims, eager to bear witness to a trauma that the years haven't healed. Much to its credit, the university has responded in kind, insisting that neither Moore's memorial nor its meanings be left behind. Last year, December 2nd, 19, uh, December 2nd, 2017, which was, remember, the 75th anniversary of Fermi's successful experiment and 50 years since the dedication of Moore's bronze, yet another commemoration was staged. In fact, the first version of this paper was written for that occasion and artworks were commissioned from students and faculty, and most memorably, Moore's sculpture became the focus of a temporary sculptural inst uh, installation that somehow manages to restate, if in quite different terms, something of what Adam Peace so tensely suggests. Titled Nuclear Threshold, it was conceived and executed by a two-person San Francisco-based design team, uh, a Gridziak Prillinger Architects, which uh, is known unsurprisingly as OPA. Half bench, half sculpture, it deployed a solid synthetic rubber tubing to enact both a, a real, but also a sort of symbolic transformation. It says it was as if without warning, a bench on which people uh, sat calmly undid itself, devolves abruptly into a vision or a representation, not simply of chaos, but of the very moment when total destruction starts to take hold. A representation of the moment, I paraphrase, uh, when a protein pile of material devolves into exponential complexity. What strikes me most in this, complex, in this context, however, is that nuclear thresholds was designed to be so intimately connected with atom piece, or what Chicago calls it, nuclear energy. The photograph shows you the kind of field which it creates around the sculpture itself. As the coils of the former writhe around the latter, uh, order and chaos compete. 
And both objects are in a vividly ironic contrast to the tersely empirical quantification that actually ordered nuclear experimentation from the start. 40,000 graphite blocks are contained in that uh, uh, minimalist quasi-sculpture that you see, enclosing 19,000 pieces of, of uranium metal and uranium oxide fuel all of them stacked and counted with a precision worthy of the most minimal, meticulous minimalist. Faced with this manifestation, neither either war or neither war nor peace come to mind. Instead, I'm oddly struck as I looked at this uh, this image of the. I'm most struck somehow by the posture of the Charlie Chaplin lookalike. He's sort of nonchalant, but also exhausted. Uh, his piling labors um, now done. Their problem, the problem is the problem of the representation of explosion, of chaos. And together, uh, both OPA and uh, Moore uh, help us focus again on what explosion is like. At this point, our labors are beginning to come to an end. Once again, we return to Moore's monument and what it conveys. The artist himself was disinclined to say, I quote, the idea for nuclear energy did not come from any particular natural object. I can't fully explain how the idea of it arrived. With sculpture like Moore's, I think we do well to take his reluctance to heart. It's easy to fix on a source or a reference point, but who's to say it's right? And the source of a sculpture isn't the same as what it's about. With this in mind, I'm going to return to Adam Peace for one final look, trying to keep alive a sense of it, not simply as head or a helmet, or for that matter, top and bottom. I think of it instead as governed by opposing logics, even rhetorics, fixed and lifting, rough and smooth, bearing and bulging. Taking the measure of this sculpture demands keeping these contradictory energies in play. If you collapse them, if you choose between them, then half the sculpture disappears, which perhaps suggests, yeah, again, that Adam Peace is hard to tie down or spell out. As I've been arguing, Moore thought so too. In a single conversation about his sculpture, he touched on every reference point this lecture has invoked. Mushroom, mushroom cloud, head, skull, cathedral. And then, three years after the work was finished and installed, uh, the year was 1970, in fact, a series of photographs was taken showing the sculptor apparently working, again, on the maquette of Adam Peace, which had been inaugurated three years before. Beside him was uh, the elephant skull that he acquired as a gift again after the work was complete. This skull, too, has been taken as a source for the work. Now, there's really nothing at all unusual about an artist being vague about meaning, but such vagaries ought not to be dismissed. Contradictions have plenty to say. Listen to more again. Perhaps some of the changes this is more, perhaps some of the changes occurred in the lower interior part of the large version, which I made in plaster of Paris, because I actually worked inside it. So I could have this feeling of being in a large form, which was protecting me. I'll, what a phrase, a large form, which was protecting me. Cathedral, perhaps 
but also cathedral as womb. Thus Moore went on to say that the lower part of the work could be thought of as a protective form and constructed for human beings, while the top was more like the destructive side of the atom. So inside and outside, the top and bottom uh, shift focus of protection and destruction as the artist speaks of his uh, bodily responses to the work. Top and bottom once again. This is the duality that I'm trying to confront. Destruction and protection in a single form. Between the two, Moore said, this, is, this uh, again is a quote, between the two it might convey to people in a symbolic way the whole event. If he was right, if Adam Peace can convey the whole event, then its whole is very much this charged composite, this bulging shape, this hidden interior, the sheltering pillars, the sort of nature and culture, uh, destruction and, uh, and uh, generation in one. And threat and solace and earthbound and uplifted with all of these tensions joining together in a single uh, emblem for our times. Preparing for this, I'm going to go right here. Preparing for this lecture, uh, and indeed since I uh, did the very first version, I've been looking at many mushroom clouds in pursuit of um, the question of how these contradictions and how these forms and these tensions come together. Looking at clouds and then back and trying to see uh, some of what I, I think is part of the surface look of the dome. And none seem to fit. Mostly mushroom clouds dispel. They are amorphous. Not this one. Uh, this one shows uh, a different phenomenon. Um, the terrible beauty of the bomb as it begins to blossom up and outwards, the beauty that was captured by the photographer Berlin Brixner, who filmed at the first nuclear test, the which was the release of a hydrogen bomb at Trinity, New Mexico in 1945, captured the formation of what is known as a Wilson cloud, which is this fleeting effect of condensation in the initial stages of the explosion. And with this image in mind, I also began to imagine, inevitably perhaps, the upraised dome of Adam Peace as a bulging belly, a belly whose fullness conveys tensions and even distension of the sort that sets you wondering what would happen if it burst. And I think at least part of my response is based on what might be called something like uh, a traumatic recognition that in this tension uh, is, uh, lurks. This is uh, perhaps um, a trauma I'm passing on to you. Uh, a photograph made 20 years uh, later than the installation in 1986, a terrifyingly toxic uh, concoction concerning pregnancy untitled 160 by Cindy Sherman. Now, I'm not really asking you to see the same things I do in Adam Peace. But what I do want to encourage is a more searching approach to Moore's bodily forms. Surely it's important to recognize that in Moore's work, the central bodily binaries are almost always in play. Which is not to say that merely that they are present on the contrary, they are actively reimagined as the structural logic of his art. Shouldn't we stand in fear and trembling before this upraised belly, 
wondering what havoc will emerge. Were we to take up that position, we would ourselves be assuming what for more was a publicly political stance. This too, he is asking us to see. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope that there are questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, I too am someone who have, has looked at many uh, images of mushroom clouds yeah. <laughs> in my work. Um, and one, um, one f uh, set of images that comes to mind is, are those by Harold Edgerton. Um, mm -hmm. the black and white photographs that often portray, um, well, they were all taken in the desert, um, the Southwest desert, mm -hmm. and they are all in black and white, and they're taken with Edgerton's um, Rapatronics yes. camera. Yeah, I have seen those. Yeah. Right, I'm sure you've come across yeah. them. Um, but they, they have featured that bubble form, that yeah. bursting bubble form. And they, al they also often feature the lattice work, the kind of structures that um, held up some of the, the bombs in the desert. Um, yeah. So you can sometimes see in those images the armature, the kind of physical structure that um, kind of propped that up. That propped up the bomb. Yeah. So anyway, I just sort of that reference came to mind. And I also, in terms of the bodily exposure, um, was thinking about the photographers in the desert who were also exposing themselves to some of the radiation as they were coming close to these testing sites. Yeah. Um, yes, that's more of a comment than a question. Well, it's, uh, it's a great comment, and of course the whole sort of um, apparatus, the sort of technology of the atomic explosion, how, how, you, how you cite the bomb, how you make it. Um, I've never really thought about that, and it would be a very interesting sort of quasi-sculptural investigation. I mean, it's, it's really striking, isn't it, that the, um, that the original pile you know, does look like a minimalist construction, and they photographed every single stage of its construction. There's a whole series that show us the, uh, the uh, gathering together and the arrangement of these uh, various um, uh, elements which will, uh, you know, be uh, what, what they move this lead rod in and out in order to generate the, um, uh, the talk, you know, the, what are they, the critical mass that will release the energy. I'm not, I'm losing my language, but yes. I, I will go look at the Edgerton ones again. Thank you. for a very moving and thought-provoking um, lecture. I actually had a couple of questions that have to do both with the, the, with the extraordinary series of photographs of the process of mm -hmm. its making mm -hmm. and installing. Um, and related to that, the way the, the work itself, um, well, among the sort of pairs of contradictory qualities, mm -hmm that one could think about would be finish and unfinish, mm -hmm. which suggest a process uh, on the one hand that's over and done with, mm -hmm. and a process that's ongoing. And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering if you have any, well, first of all, I'm wondering if it's normal or was normal for Moore to photograph the process in that way. One of the things that is um, very tantalizing about the series of photographs that I've showed you that are, were taken in the foundry in Nowak, um, which are so striking. So those photographs um, are published in a piece, uh, in an article, uh, which was um, produced by a man called David Katzive, who was in the art world in Chicago. He was a graduate student in Chicago and now lives in New York. And he's someone that, um, Christine Maring has been in touch with, who she, she was very much involved in this nuclear thing. And 
in the 70s, Katsav um, was in touch with Moore and he did a radio, uh, sorry, a telephone um, interview with him, which he published and it is illustrated by these photographs. And they are not at NOAC and they're not at um, uh, the Moore Foundation. And uh, I've written Mr. Katsav two emails so far and I don't have them, and I don't know uh, who took them or where they are. But you know, I was certainly on the telephone <laughs> with the, with Berlin, trying to um, trying to find them. But anyway, I think they are unusual, and um, they are. The, uh, I believe that this series, all the photographs that I have shown you, are as sort of unusual and erratic as any series of um, production uh, photographs could be. And, and um, your, I mean, Moore's work is, jet, you know, is copiously photographed, but this series seems to me to have certain moments that really catch the mind. And when I found the one, the white one, the plaster, I didn't, you know, I don't think anybody knows it's there. It's in this grotty old catalog that they're, you know, now the Moore Foundation is wondering if it should even publish the work anymore, publish a, a catalog raisonné, but they stuck this thing in. Anyway, that's a really rambling response. Please ask me a question so I can uh, focus and not <laughs> ramble. I don't know, it just seemed that the photographs were particularly involved in underlining um, process. Yeah. And, that the, and in the finished work, you also have this kind of holding in, in suspension, a kind of something that's finished and in the temporal sense as well. Yeah. And something that's still ongoing. Yeah. I think that's right. And I, and I think that it's very interesting, you know, in when we discuss paintings or when you discuss paintings, so much of the process seems to be there on the surface. But if you, you know, if you have access to um, radiography or some other technical or, or uh, exploration or drawings, they become part of the story and the way, that, the way one sees the work. And I think that for me, more and more, the, the sense of what the object is you know, the sense of its history of production, its making, its, its the way that it comes to be in the world is the work. And I'm increasingly unable to separate those things from my understanding of the thing. And I don't think we ought to, actually. I think we ought to be materialist enough to know how the world around us is made and the objects around us are made. They are the objects. Thanks, Sam, for such a thought-provoking lecture. I just wanted to pick up on your point about shelter and the relationship... I'm sorry, um, my dear, what, about what? Shelter, the idea of a sculpture as shelter, and you say um, as protection and shelter. Yes, yeah. Um, especially in relationship to the scale of these yeah. works. And I think that idea of, sh of shelter was obviously one that Moore used in other works, making shelters for sheep. <laughs> from sculpture, shelter drawings, the idea that sculpture, especially in its public form, perhaps had a use value as a gathering yeah. place. Yeah. As, so that sort of idea of shelter is metaphorical, but I, I think as well in just seeing him standing in, it, in the lee of the sculpture being yeah. protected by it. And I just wondered whether that, you know, we could read that as part of Moore's reimagining of a kind of humanist vision for sculpture in the public realm. Yes, of course. You're absolutely, you know, you're so right, and I love the allusion to the sh you know, the shelter for the sheep. I mean, um, I think one of the joys in, of working on more is that you you are, one is working uh, on a humanist with a, you know with a, with an individual who um, who had a very particular vision of the world and of what the kind of work that his sculpture could do in public. And it's, I mean, what's curious, of course, is that we, are, we have to excavate, in some sense, that humanism. But it's, it's there, and it, um, it's such an interesting uh, and challenging point of difference 
to everything else around it. I think of Locking Peace, which I went to see yesterday, day before yesterday, and I saw a um, Knife Edge Two Piece too. And, but these are both sculptures in London, and um, and they they both are very public. They're all, you know very much in central London, and they're there, and they are so declaratively di different in their complexity and their formal oddity and presence from everything else around them. That, and that difference uh, from a bus or a light fixture or a politician or, or anything is sort of the gift that, it, that Moore's work is giving. It's giving a kind of visual complexity in a very complex world, but that is, uh, manages to find its it, difference in a you know, non-commodified, non-utilitarian way. A shelter, for, a shelter for the mind, if not a shelter for the body. I'm going to think more about shelter, though. Give me shelter. Thank you so much, Anne. That was fantastic. And I, I, I mean, it sort of picks up on Carol's question about process, but also thinking about the kind of multiple temporalities that are maybe proposed by the sculpture, which really struck me so much that we have you know, a sculpture about atomic energy, the atom piece, and one immediately thinks about the instant, um, and yet there's such a sense of a kind of slowness uh, that, the, that the sculpture also proposes, and then this idea of a kind of memorial time that it's also gesturing to Fermé and his work. Um, uh, so I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on, on the way it sort of interacts with time. I also thought about, you know, some of the installation shots that you showed and the kind of way in which the space around it has this sort of culminating sensibility, the, the, the kind of granite uh, yeah. work around it, yeah. that it does kind of culminate in that sense, but um, we don't get the kind of instant and fallout um, that kind of duality, if we're thinking about a, a different sets of dualities that one um, so often uh, has with, with the notion of um, the atom. Uh, so uh, that was sort of one question. And another question is just I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, about texture and how that's working because the, you know, there is such a sort of textural sensibility about the, the surface, yeah. but then also these sort of gashes and roughness as well. So. Yeah, I mean, actually, as you were speaking, um, for so I, I kind of intuited that you were going to go to the texture. And um, as you were speaking, I was, uh, I think that one of the things that the, my lecture doesn't do effectively is speak enough to the texture. And um, there's something about the texture that I have never, s let's see if we can get back. Well, um, I mean, obviously that's as textured as they come, but you know what I'm trying to say, it sounds kind of crazy, but um, I think, do, have you, do you know what etretat looks like? Do you know like the, the edge of a, the edge of the sea? You know, there's something about these, um, these sort of pillars that seem to sort of be eroded and gashed by time. They had, I think that they are in another time. And I've never really said that. I've, ne I've never, they have a monumentality which is, uh, emulates um, sort of geographical time, or is it ge geological time? That's what it is. And um, I suppose that that goes, from, goes with the sense of the other sort of time and the swelling that's erupting from the, the top. Um, and I'm glad I've sort of spat that out, um, that that is part of how it seems to work. And it also the case though that he, that the, they're not all, they're not evenly treated though, the pillars, they're, they are, and that's part of their, their oddity, they want to be, 
they, they want to be welcoming and they also want to be permanent and have this other sort of geological presence, I think. I don't, that's hardly an answer to your question. Yeah. Hi, and this follows on from the, some of the, the questions you already had, but I was, I was struck by how much attention you did give to your interest in the upper register of this piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe for, uh, you know, for good reasons, you didn't really explore so much the lower register, or the lower mm -hmm. half of this piece. And I think the kind of questions you've been asked seem to suggest that we might want to start thinking about that lower half in relation to either you know, ancient monuments, ancient pillars, ancient geological time, the cathedral, that notion of the, the ancient monument that provides a certain kind of shelter but also alludes to something greater and even something much more central about the cradling hand or the, some, the something that holds the, the space inside as a place for shelter, as Sarah was saying. And then, that, then when you think of the lower half of the sculpture in those sorts of terms, then that eruption of the upper half seems to make a lot more sense and a ways in which it, it seems to com commemorate or register a new age, whether atomic or nuclear, that's exploded out of that ancient monumental structure and yeah, history that's sort of bubbling that seems up. to be explored and uh, nostalgically remembered in some ways in the discussion of the in, the, in the way in which he treats the lower half. Why is it nostalgic? Because it remembers a moment when you could have shelter and that, that I mean, I don't know, I, that, I don't, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the important point of my question, I suppose, or observation, but that notion of shelter. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I have been well aware of in, about this lecture is that um, it is given a shape um, uh, my, by my interest in the female body and um, by my, um, it is the case that I had, when I said, I used the phrase a sort of traumatic recognition that I have never been able to look at Adam Peace without thinking of Cindy Sherman and of that particular, uh, particular photograph. And there's something, um, How can I say this? The dome is so exposed and it's up there and it, uh, it's, ex it's ex it, of course it could explode or it could be exploded. And um, that aspect of the work has been the thing that sort of has nagged at me and has made me want to I always I want to see the sort of duality of um, genders in particular works and not ignore them. And this this paper is a part of that. Um, writing it has made me understand that I do need to, you know to talk about the whole thing. That you can never focus on just one. Now that I've pulled the uh, the belly out of it or the the sort of productive the eruptive part of it. Um, it's a curious thing to be up at the podium and have a recognition of one's own um, scholarly blindness, you know, because uh, I think that I was well aware before I came into this room that now there has to be another part which is about the bottom. Um, But the force of the work, I think, I, th I think that OPA and it's, with its chaotic installation um, picked up the thing that Moore could never say, you know, the thing picked up the chaos that is inside, that is the threat of atom peace or nuclear energy. And I, I will find it hard to get rid of that but I think more, you know, I, I take this point. I think it's a good point. I'm really glad to have it. That you've all given it to me from 
several different directions now and I'm going to embrace it. Love it dearly.